Welcome to Chapter 8 on Crime. Criminal behavior extends far beyond the street crime that is fodder for television dramas. White-collar crime has a greater economic impact than street crime. Criminal law differs in important ways from civil law, the subject of most of the text. The state prosecutes the wrongdoer, the wrongdoer can face lengthy imprisonment or death, and rights embedded in the Constitution protect individuals accused by the state of criminal behavior. Ben Johnson stated, He threatens many that hath injured one. And French scientist Pascal said, Most of the evils of life arise from man's being unable to sit still in a room. Civil law concerns the rights and liabilities between private parties. Criminal law concerns those activities that society has outlawed. In a criminal trial, the government decides whether to prosecute and the defendant has a right to a jury trial. In a criminal suit, the court determines the guilt so that a punishment may be given. A felony is a serious crime with a sentence of a year or more in prison. Misdemeanors are less serious, often with a sentence of less than a year. There are many purposes of punishment restraint, deterrence, retribution, vengeance, and or rehabilitation. Restraint is meant to keep a violent criminal away from the rest of society. The courts hope that when a criminal is punished, he or she, as well as others, will avoid future crimes to avoid future punishment. Giving a criminal a punishment equal to his crime is meant to serve as retribution. Vengeance is sought by trying to make the criminal suffer. Rehabilitation is when training is provided to allow the prisoner to return to a normal life eventually. When a prosecutor prepares for a case, they must show that the defendant's alleged activity is indeed illegal. They also have the burden of proof. The jury must believe beyond a reasonable doubt in order to convict. This is to protect innocent defendants from undeserved punishment. The prosecution must also, also show that the defendant committed the act, not just talked about doing it. Most crimes require that prosecutors prove general intent and they'll try to show that the defendant intended to do the illegal act they're accused of doing. When prosecutors try to prove specific intent, they are attempting to show that the defendant intended to do something beyond the act they are accused of. Reckless or negligent conduct is proven if the prosecutor shows that the defendant consciously disregarded a substantial risk of injury to another. Certain actions, however, don't require a guilty state of mind, only proof that the defendant did the illegal action. This is referred to as strict liability. Many people are often confused by mens rea. How does the state prove criminal intent? The distinction between actus reus and mens rea may lead many to believe that separate proof is required for each or that mens rea requires proof of a defendant's subjective intent. For most crimes, the prosecution proves criminal intent by proving that the defendant committed the forbidden act. For example, let's say Miller and Bud were in a bar together and Miller hit Bud over the head with a beer bottle. In Miller's trial for criminal assault for smashing a bottle over Bud's head, the prosecution proves Miller's intent by proving that he purposely picked up the bottle and hit Bud with it. The prosecution need not prove what was actually going on in Miller's mind. A defendant who can prove he was insane at the time of the crime will not be declared guilty. There are two basic tests used to determine sanity. The McNaughton rule must show a serious identifiable mental illness and that he didn't understand the nature of his act. Irresistible, irresistible impulse means that the lawyer must show that a mental defect left the defendant unable to control his behavior. A very small percentage of defendants plead insanity and a very small percentage of those are acquitted. Those who are acquitted often spend longer in mental institutions than they would have spent in prison. Many people, again from media exposure, possess wildly inaccurate views of the insanity defense.
They will usually grossly overstate how often defendants use it and how often it's successful. They will also fail to understand its moral basis, that the state should not impose criminal penalties on those who are not responsible for their acts. In the case of Biber versus the people, Donald Biber walked up to a truck in which William Ellis was sitting and shot Ellis, whom he didn't know, in the back of his head. He threw Ellis's body from the truck and drove away. Shortly before and after the killing, Biber encountered various people in different places. He sang God Bless America and the Marine Hymn to them and told them he was a prisoner of war and was being followed by communists. He said he had killed a communist on War Memorial Highway. The police arrested him. Biber had a long history of drug use, including amphetamines, and dealt drugs as an adult. Several years before the homicide, Biber feared he would hurt someone and voluntarily entered a hospital for treatment for mental impairment. He was later released into long -term, into a long-term drug program. Biber was charged with first-degree murder. He pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. An expert witness testified that he was insane, suffering from amphetamine delusional disorder, ADD, a recognized psychiatric illness resulting from long-term use of amphetamines and characterized by delusions. At trial, Biber's attorney argued that he was not intoxicated at the time of the crime, but that he was insane due to ADD. The trial court refused to instruct that Biber could be legally insane due to ADD, and the jury found Biber guilty of first-degree murder. He appealed. Do you think a jury could find that a defendant with ADD is legally insane? In this case, the court affirmed Biber's conviction. If the court had reversed the conviction, do you think Biber would have gone free? No, there would have been another trial in which he could plead insanity to, an, to a jury. Suppose a defendant goes to a bar, gets blind drunk, and then goes out and robs a store. Is his intoxication a defense to the robbery? No. In most states, voluntary intoxication is no defense to a crime. Some states may admit voluntary intoxication as evidence that the defendant could not form the specific intent necessary for certain crimes. For example, a defendant charged with assault with intent to kill might seek to demonstrate a degree of intoxication that prevented his forming the intent to murder. This is a separate issue from the general point the court makes in Biber versus the people. Intoxication is generally no defense. Since voluntary intoxication is not a defense to a crime, you may be wondering why Biber even bothered to raise his drug issue. Biber acknowledged that voluntary intoxication is no defense. He was not arguing that he was intoxicated. He was attempting to make a different defense. Biber claimed that he was legally insane. His argument is that prolonged drug use left him afflicted with ADD, an established psychiatric ailment. You may be wondering why his argument did not persuade the court. This is because his drug use was voluntary. Whatever mental disease it caused, Biber brought it upon himself through his years of amphetamine use. It didn't matter that he didn't know that ADD might be a result of his drug use. The reason some drugs are illegal is that they're bad for you. When someone, drugs, when someone abuses illegal drugs, then the law will probably not exclude, exclude them from whatever actions they take after suffering their effects. Entrapment refers to when the government induces a defendant to break the law. They must prove that the defendant was predisposed to commit the crime. Duress refers to a defendant if he or she can show that a threat by a third person caused her to fear an imminent physical harm. Larceny refers to trespassing or taking personal property with the intent to steal it. This means that someone else originally had the property and it's personal property, not services or real estate. Fraud is the deception for the purpose of taking money or property from someone else. This includes bank fraud, wire or mail fraud, insurance fraud, and Medicare fraud. Arson means using fire or explosives to damage or destroy property, usually with either malicious or fraudulent intent. Insurance fraud causes higher premiums for everyone.